In paleontology, myths don't die easily. For decades, Arctodus Simus the giant short-faced bear of Ice Age North America was cast as an unstoppable killer. But every part of the evidence, its skull, its limbs, its diet, its ecology, has shifted the picture. And when scientists pieced it all together, they uncovered not a super predator, but a super adaptable omnibus. To watch the myth unravel is to watch science at its most captivating. Over the next five segments, we'll dismantle every assumption and walk away with a new, deeper appreciation of this colossal animal. It was easy for early interpretations to turn Arctodus into a nightmare from the Ice Age. Picture a bear that could stand taller than almost any modern predator, its skull looking compressed and its body scaled in a way that seemed built for speed. Put that animal into the vast open plains of North America and you can see why it was imagined sprinting after horses, camels or even humans towering above its prey as a relentless hunter. This wasn't just a casual idea. For a long time, paleontologists themselves leaned into the vision of a killer unlike any other known bear. Others countered with the thought that it was less an active hunter and more of a scavenger muscling in on kills made by other carnivores and crushing bones with a skull built for raw power. Either way, the animal was assigned to one extreme of the spectrum, either a terrifying predator or a carcass stealing specialist feeding off the labor of others. The roots of these ideas go back to a combination of size and circumstance. Arctodus simus was enormous some individuals approaching weights far beyond modern brown or polar bears and sheer size has always carried an assumption of predatory authority. On top of this, the first sites where it gained scientific notoriety added fuel to the fire. Rancho La Brea in California, better known as the La Brea Tar Pits, preserved its skeletons alongside a graveyard of mammoths, saber-toothed cats and dire wolves. That dramatic association framed the bear as a player in battles for dominance, prompting imaginations to fill gaps with chases across grasslands and crushing kills. These finds created a perfect stage for colorful reconstructions in both the scientific and popular press during the 20th century. When isotope studies began to be applied to the fossils, they seemed to confirm the hype. Early analyses pointed toward high levels of animal protein in its diet, which appeared to place the bear at the very top of the food web. That fit smoothly into the image of a hypercarnivore, an apex predator shaped like no other bear. Popular media quickly amplified these conclusions. Artwork showed a monster sprinting down bison or swatting giant sloths to the ground, Museum displays exaggerated limb proportions and compressed facial bones, reinforcing the idea that evolution had sculpted a super predator adapted for pursuit and precision killing. It didn't matter that most of these illustrations leaned more on imagination than data. The images were compelling and they lingered. The divide between predator and scavenger camps added complexity, but kept the bear locked in roles defined by extremes. They, those who cast it as a scavenger emphasized its mass and argued that long legs gave it range rather than sprinting speed, letting it cover huge distances in search of carcasses. Others leaned toward the predator model and highlighted its role as a specialized hunter. What both sides missed was how little direct evidence existed for either scenario. The isotopes impressive as they looked in tables could not discriminate between an animal that ate only fresh kills and one that fed opportunistically on a mix of meat sources. Yet the lack of concrete proof didn't stop the dominant myths from persisting. The shift only began when new approaches, microware analysis and comparative studies with living bears forced a full rethink. Once multiple lines of evidence came together, the foundation beneath the super predator collapsed, exposing how much of its terrifying image rested on fragile ground. In the end, the story of Arctodus shows how a skeleton pulled from tar pits can turn into an ice age legend, not through data alone, but through imagination eager to fill in the blanks with spectacle. When people first looked at the skeleton of Arctodus simus, the proportions seemed unusual. The skull looked squashed in from the front as if the snout had been cut short and the legs appeared far longer and straighter than those of any bear alive as today. That combination alone helped build the idea that this was no ordinary bear. 
but one built for a specific role, maybe something closer to a giant cat than a heavy omnivore. The nickname Short-Faced Bear was born from this impression, and for decades it carried all the weight of a dramatic title framing the animal as something fundamentally different from its relatives. In early reconstructions, the compact skull was presented as evidence of a design suited to sheer strength focused on shearing meat or cracking bones rather than the variety of feeding seen in living bears. The reality is far less extreme. Anatomists later pointed out that the face only looked shortened because of the way the nasal bones and rostrum were shaped. Tremarctine bears the subfamily to which Arctodus belongs all share this feature and it is particularly visible in the spectacled bear of South America. In that animal, the snout appears flat compared to a brown bear, but the internal proportions are not reduced in the sense of shaving down the skull. What is seen instead is a reconfiguration, shorter nasal bones, deeper rostrum that changes surface appearance without altering the functional length of the face. This means the so-called short-faced skull isn't a highly specialized carnivore adaptation, it is simply a family trait carried by generalist bears as well. The same kind of mistaken impression applied to its limbs. Drawings and mounted skeletons emphasize their straightness. And when you contrasted those bones against the more robust, stocky frames of grizzlies, they seem built for covering ground. This idea of long legs led to claims that Arctodus could pursue prey across the steppe like a primitive cheetah bear bringing down horses and camels in open country. Yet when researchers actually calculated limb proportions relative to body size, they found only modest differences. The legs weren't unusually long when, uh, when scaled correctly, but the illusion was intensified by another feature. The torso of Arctodus was relatively short and massive. That body shape made the limbs look stretched when mounted side by side with those of other bears. In life, those legs would not have given the animal any special running ability. Instead, the bulk of the body would have favored endurance and stability, not high-speed chase. Optical illusions of this kind are common in paleontology, especially when reconstructions are made from incomplete skeletons. A shift in posture or the perspective of a photograph can change proportions dramatically. With Arctodus body mass, only amplified the effect. A huge rib cage and powerful shoulders compressed visually against straight bones, making those bones look more exaggerated. When compared carefully to relatives, however, the measurements fall back into line. The bones of Arctodus match closer with modern spectacled bears than with a predator like a hyena or a lion. That alignment is important because it shows that both skull and limb form are consistent with an ursid built for versatility rather than an animal fine-tuned for one extreme role. What this reveals is that appearances can mislead even experts when filtered through assumptions. The short face and the long legs were never quite what they seemed. Instead of markers of a, a hyper-specialized predator, they were features shared with ordinary bears, their dramatic look born from perspective rather than adaptation. In the end, the skeleton tells a layered story, but the message is clear. The famous outline of Arctodus was not evidence of a unique pursuit hunter. It was the frame of a generalist hidden behind illusions. Some of the earliest chemical evidence gave a misleadingly narrow view of what this bear ate. In particular, isotope studies from Alaska and the Yukon returned elevated nitrogen 15 levels, which researchers interpreted as signs of high trophic level feeding in those northern populations. On the surface, that matched the idea of a predator living almost entirely on animal protein. Yet when isotope results from other regions were brought into the picture, the pattern fractured. Values did not line up consistently across sites and they showed that some populations leaned more heavily on plants or browsing herbivores. For bears especially, isotopic signals are ambiguous high nitrogen values can reflect a lot of animal protein, but not whether that protein came from active predation scavenging or a mix. Right away, the evidence argued against a single specialized feeding strategy. To resolve that uncertainty, researchers turned to teeth. The enamel of molars carries microscopic wear patterns left behind by chewing and those patterns vary between animals that consume bone soft plants or fibrous vegetation. When the teeth of Arctodus were examined under magnification, they told a very different story from the super predator myth. Hyenas which routinely crack bones show heavy pitting and fracture damage. Arctodus lacked those signatures. 
Its teeth look more like those of black bears or spectacled bears species that survive on fruits, fibrous leaves and occasional meat. The distinction was stark. The short-faced bear was not a bone-crushing scavenger, but something far more flexible. This contrast becomes even sharper when Arctodus is compared to a notorious contemporary predator from La Brea, the saber-toothed cat Smilodon. Smilodon was a specialized hypercarnivore with 28 semium long canines used to dispatch large prey and dentition designed entirely for shearing flesh. In contrast, Arctodus possessed large flat molars with broad surfaces, a structure perfectly suited for grinding a wide variety of foods from tough vegetation to bone and flesh. While Smilodon was a killing machine fine-tuned for a single purpose, the jaws of Arctodus tell the story of an opportunist, a generalist capable of capitalizing on whatever the Pleistocene environment had to offer. A key turning point came with dental microwear texture analysis or DMTA. At Rancho La Brea, the lower second molars revealed surface textures most closely matching those of modern spectacled bears, a tree mark tine lineage that relies heavily on plants and fruits. They did not resemble the rough punctured textures of bone crackers. In clear terms, DMTA showed that Arctodus teeth at La Brea had the surface patterns of an omnivore, not a carcass-driven scavenger. This crucial finding undercut the idea of a species-wide reliance on bones and positioned the bear among generalist feeders instead. The broader lesson is that the diet of Arctodus was not uniform. Northern populations in Beringia show isotopic evidence consistent with heavy consumption of caribou and other C3 feeding herbivores. By contrast, southern populations like those represented in California show carbon signatures more consistent with C3 vegetation and browsing herbivores. In other words, the bear's feeding strategy shifted depending on the resources available in its habitat. This flexibility is what defines an omnivore, not a fixed role as hunter or scavenger. There may also have been dietary differences within populations. Studies suggest males larger in body size may have consumed more meat, while females relied more heavily on vegetation, paralleling patterns seen in modern brown and polar bears. Such variation again speaks to adaptability with the species able to partition resources rather than forced into a single ecological role. Taken together, the teeth isotopes and comparative anatomy clarify that Arctodosimus was an opportunistic consumer. In one region, it could gorge on migrating caribou. In another, it might browse shrubs or exploit softer vegetation. At Rancho La Brea, its microweir shows avoidance of brittle foods such as bone with a diet of softer but fibrous matter. This is not the mark of a predator locked into a narrow niche, but of a generalist occupying a wide ecological space. The implications are striking. What made this giant bear successful was not mechanical specialization for killing, but the ability to adjust. Like modern brown bears, it could thrive on berries, scavenge meat, and seasonal prey shifting strategies as landscapes and climates changed. Its size and power certainly mattered, but its survival strategy was flexibility. That adaptability allowed it to span diverse environments from Arctic plains to temperate woodlands. But even broad diets have limits. Environmental pressures at the end of the Pleistocene would test whether adaptability alone could keep such a large omnivore on the landscape. Even giants fall, and the short-faced bear was no exception. Near the end of the Pleistocene, roughly 12,800 years ago, Arctodus simus disappeared from North America. Its extinction was part of a broader event that swept away mammoths, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths, and countless others. Rather than one clear killer, the collapse of Ice Age ecosystems reflected a tangle of pressures acting all at once. For the short-faced bear, its size diet and narrow genetic base all combined to make survival in the changing world increasingly difficult. In Beringia, the northern stretch of land that joined present-day Alaska and Siberia, the species vanished much earlier. Fossils show Arctodus was gone from the region around 23,000 years ago, long before it disappeared farther south. That timing lines up with Heinrich Event 2, a sudden period of harsh cooling that altered landscapes across the Northern Hemisphere. Open woodlands shifted toward new vegetation patterns, and for a bear requiring vast amounts of food, that transition likely proved costly. With less nutritious plant life, 
and fewer large herbivores available to feed on, the balance tilted out of reach. At the same time, competitors were stepping into the niche. Brown bears expanded into North America from Eurasia around 13,000 years ago, and unlike their giant cousins, they carried high genetic diversity. That gave them more flexibility under environmental stress. Isotopic studies suggest Beringian Arctodus relied heavily on terrestrial meat sources clustering tightly around caribou and other herbivores. By comparison, some brown bear populations were already feeding on salmon and other varied resources. This difference meant that brown bears had broader options while Arctodus locked into a narrower groove. When food systems broke down, the more adaptable species spread at the expense of the specialist. Dire wolves added further competition. As pack hunters, they targeted the same herbivore herds that would have been critical to Arctodus in the north. Scavenging um, opportunities once abundant during the peak of megafaunal diversity dwindled as fewer carcasses were left on the landscape. The overlap of predators funneled pressure on already shrinking food bases and a territorial species of massive size would have struggled to sustain itself. Genetics add another layer of explanation. Research points to low genetic diversity in Arctodocimus, possibly the result of bottlenecks or local extinctions before the last glacial maximum. That shallow gene pool reduced its ability to adapt rapidly when climate shifted or resources changed. By contrast, brown bears arriving from multiple Eurasian source populations displayed wide mitochondrial diversity. This gave them a resilience their giant relatives lacked especially as environments fragmented. Humans enter the story as well, though their exact role remains debated. A specimen from Lubbock Lake in Texas shows cut marks clear evidence that people once processed the carcass of an Arctodus. But beyond isolated finds, there is no sign that sustained hunting drove the species under. Instead, human arrival likely compounded pressures, locally competing for prey or scavenged meat without serving as the single cause of extinction. By the close of the Pleistocene, the story was sealed. Shifting climates, collapsing herbivore numbers, shrinking habitats and genetic weakness formed a multi-layered trap. The giant short-faced bear did not fall to a lone predator's spear, but to long-term ecological restructuring. In that sense, its fate captures the vulnerability even the largest creatures face when entire ecosystems reconfigure around them. The image of Arctodocimus as a towering, short-faced terror once dominated scientific and popular imagination, but that vision has been overturned. Careful re-examination shows it was not a relentless predator, but a massive omnivore, relying on flexibility rather than specialization. This change demonstrates how fragile first impressions can be when tested against broader evidence. By stripping away illusions of bone structure, and diet paleontology reveals a truer picture. The story of Arctodus is more than just about a bear. It reminds us that science is provisional and even long-held ideas can be reshaped almost overnight.